I'm going to hit the live button. And we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Women in STEM event today. So today we're going to be going through and teach you some of the history about the role of women in STEM and how they have paved the way for women to have their place in STEM and all the different great things that I have done. So to start the event, I'd like to introduce Nancy from the Murray Center for Women in Technology here at NJIT. Hi, I'm Nancy Steffen Fleur, and I'm a faculty member in NJIT's Humanities Department. And as you can see from our backdrop, I'm director of the university's Murray Center for Women in Technology. Um, so I'm gonna I'm I'm assuming that that most of our audience out here are elementary school and middle school um, girls, and and maybe some boys too. That's good. Um, so I'm gonna tell a little story about why. It's kind of important to have Women's History Month because it may not be obvious why it is. So this is kind of from my own life. When I was your age, uh, the thing I wanted to do most when I grew up was to go to the planet Mars, um, or at least design a rocket that would go to the planet Mars and look around for a while. Um, it was it was the beginning of of what we now call the sort of space exploration era, and did start in the United States. It started actually the Soviet Union um, um, launched a, a satellite called Sputnik about 1957 that went around. We were all looking to see it. I couldn't see it. I wanted to see it. So I, I went to various places to universities with my dad to look in big telescopes and look out in outer space. I read a lot of science fiction. I made a telescope of my own, put it together um, and um, and I actually looked at Mars through my telescope and other scopes, and I put together a little science project. You know, it had pictures and drawings. It was called Mars, Planet of Mystery. I was very proud of it. And I, it came time for, we, we had a, a little science fair. And I went there, and it was kind of in a gymnasium. And I stood next to set up my little booth and everything, next to my friend Henry Ramel. And I was all excited about it. And then Hen I heard Henry's father came over. And he said, Henry, come over here. Don't stand next to the girl. And suddenly it occurred to me that I was the girl. And I looked around and there was hardly anybody in the room that was a girl like me. So I kind of thought after a while that maybe girls weren't supposed to like rockets or outer space or going to Mars. And so I became an English teacher, which wasn't a bad thing. Um, but I did that because I could see a lot of women that I know who were teachers, and I could see myself in them. But I couldn't see any women at all who were interested in outer space or rockets. Well, this was the 1950s. So what's the lesson there? You have to see it to be it. And I didn't see anybody like me who was doing what I was interested in, so I gave up that first best dream and got interested in other things. But if we'd had Women's History Month back when I was a little girl so many years ago, I'd probably be packing my bags for Mars right now, or at least I would be sitting in the NASA control room because there were women, as it turns out, back then when I was little who were interested in rockets and outer space. I just didn't know about them. Um, some of them, I think many of you probably know about some of them right now because the, the book and the movie Hidden Figures has come, has come out, you know, about hidden figures. And so we know that Katherine Johnson was terrifically important in the American space program and Dorothy Vaughn, um, who was a very early and, and extraordinary kind of computer scientist and Mary Jackson. Um, and then there are uh, uh, many, many other women that I know about now that I wish I'd known about then that you can find out about. There's a book called Rocket Girls. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot of ways to go. And just last, I guess it's last month, I think it was February 18th, um, a, an explorer called Perseverance, a good name for that explorer, landed on the planet Mars. Not the first explorer, but this one. Um, um, and because other explorers have, have landed as well. This one, there were at least seven women 
who had major roles, who have major roles in that project. Um, and it's a very diverse team, you can tell by their names. The person who announced that th that, that that explorer had landed on Mars was Swathi Mohan, uh, who's in charge of the whole operation and guidance. And then there's uh, another aerospace engineer called Diane Trujillo, and, and many, many, many other women who were involved in that project. So those women are kind of living out my dream of exploring Mars but you can live out your own dreams right now and because you can see it and therefore you can be it. And that's a kind of, uh, in a nutshell, why Women's History Month is so terrifically important to give you a, a really wide vision of all the many, many things that you could be so you can follow your own dreams. Uh, so I'm gonna turn the program back now to Emma and her team are gonna tell you about some extraordinary women scientists and, and engineers and what they've accomplished over the years. Yeah, so I'm just going to start with a quick introduction uh, about myself before we jump into the video I made. Um, my name is Emma Hamza. I am a sophomore studying chemical engineering here at NJIT. And so for the videos, we really wanted to highlight some woman who had a role in STEM and really paved the path and have always been there and made a lot of impact and because they aren't really necessary to highlight in most education. So uh, now we'll get started with the um, first video about Lisa Meitner. Dan, we're not hearing anything. We don't hear much about Lisa Meitner. In the world of physics, we are very familiar with the names and work of Bohr, Fermi, Boltzmann, and many more men. Yet we don't hear much about Lisa Meitner, who worked and studied with many of these men and also made great contributions to the field of physics, but doesn't receive the same amount of recognition. Lisa was born in 1878 in Vienna, Austria. Growing up, she had a great interest in science and mathematics, but at that time, women were not allowed to attend public universities. It wasn't until 1897 that women were allowed in higher education. So, in 1899, at 21 years old, Meitner began her secondary education, which she completed eight years of schooling in just two years. She then went to graduate school at the University of Vienna, where she became the second woman in Austria to receive her doctorate in physics in 1905. After getting her degrees, she began doing research with chemist Otto Hahn in Germany. In the first few years of working together, Hahn was paid for the work he was doing, when Meitner did the same work alongside Hahn but was not being paid. She eventually did start receiving a salary after a few years, but she was still being paid significantly less than her male counterparts. Regardless, Meitner carried on with her work, and her and Hahn worked together for 30 years studying radioactivity and nuclear decay, making lots of discoveries. Meitner eventually went on to do her own research in the 1920s at the Friedrich Wilhelm University and became the first female physics professor in Germany. She eventually had to flee Germany in 1938 due to her Jewish heritage, and she relocated to Sweden to safely continue her research. Around a year later, she reunited with Hahn to continue some unfinished work they had done on nuclear decay. This work led to their discovery of nuclear fission, which is when the nucleus of an atom splits into two smaller and lighter nuclei. About five years later, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded to Otto Hahn for this discovery, and Meitner received no credit despite having worked alongside Hahn on the discovery. This mistake was never acknowledged or fixed despite many people speaking out against it. However, Meitner continued on with her work in teaching and went on to win a long, long list of awards for her work and discoveries. And in 1992, the 109th element was named Meitnerium in her honor. Meitner contributed lots of findings to the world of physics, and she deserves the same amount of credit and recognition as the men that she worked alongside. All right, 
So now I'm going to pass the uh, ball over to Nishi to introduce herself and her video. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Nishi and I'm the second year as a biochemistry major. And my video is about Helen B. Tossig. Helen Brooke Tossig was a pioneer of pediatric cardiology, the study of children's heart disease. Dr. Tossig's challenges started early on. When she was only 11, her mother passed away from tuberculosis, and Tossig herself also contracted the disease. She also dealt with dyslexia and deafness. But her father helped her with tutoring, and she worked hard at school to be a diligent student. After college, she wanted to attend Harvard Medical School, but they did not allow women. Additionally, her father discouraged her and suggested public health administration would be more appropriate for women. Nevertheless, she persisted, and after some classes at Boston University, she was admitted to the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, one of the first co-ed schools. Dr. Tossig then went on to her major achievement, developing a surgery for Blue Baby Syndrome. Blue baby syndrome is a congenital heart disease, which means babies are born with structural problems in their hearts. Because the blood can't get the oxygen it needs from the lungs, babies appear blue in color. She used new x-ray technologies to look at the heart from different angles and figure out what structural issue was leading to the lack of oxygen. She worked with Alfred Blalock and Vivian Thomas to design the Blalock Thomas Tossig shunt and they performed their first surgery in 1944. By 1951, they had operated on over 1,000 children and the surgery had a mortality rate of only 5%. She worked around her deafness and learned to observe heartbeats by touch rather than sound and a stethoscope. She also later on described Tossig Bing syndrome, another heart disease, and actively worked to ban thalidomide, a harmful substance found in a sleeping drug that was causing babies to be born with small or abnormal limbs. Dr. Tossig received many honors throughout her life. The most notable were the Presidential Medal from President Johnson, and she was the first woman to be the head of the American Heart Association. Dr. Tossig was motivated by strong passion and overcame gender discrimination and hearing issues. She was a mentor to upcoming pediatric cardiologists, and her legacy lives on in the field. All right, next up we have Erica. So if you'd like to introduce yourself in your video. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Majewski and I am a junior studying chemical engineering at NGIT. And for my video, we will be learning about Valerie Thomas and how she's transmitting the future. Hello and welcome. In honor of Women's History Month, in this video, we will be learning about the life of Valerie Thomas, an American inventor. Valerie Thomas was born on February 8, 1943 in Maryland. She always had an interest in STEM since she was a little girl. She would always watch her father work on electronics and imaging. At the time, females partaking in STEM was not common. She got the book, The Boy's First Book on Electronics, and took great interest in it. Since her father had similar interests, she asked if he would help her with the projects in the book. However, he did not. Valerie Thomas attended an all-girls school where science classes were not considered important. However, after graduating from that school in 1961, she attended Morgan State University, where she finally had the opportunity to partake in STEM. She was one of two women who majored in physics and she graduated in 1964 with the highest honors. With that, she began working for NASA in 1964 as a mathematician slash data analyst. She worked on the Landsat project 
which was the first satellite to send multispectral images of Earth from space in order to study Earth's land masses. Her role in the project was to manage the image processing systems. Her creativity doesn't stop there though. When attending a STEM event in 1976, the illusion of a light bulb transmitting another image of itself caught her attention. She began experimenting and was able to produce a similar illusion. This led to her invention of the illusion transmitter, which uses two concave mirrors to create a 3D image. She got a patent for it in 1980. She invented the illusion transmitter with high hopes of it being used more in the future. So far, NASA and other scientists use this today for experiments. This can also lead to a future of being able to watch television in 3D without special glasses, kind of like a holograph. Valerie Thomas retired from NASA in 1995, where she was very successful in projects and positions held. Still alive today, she now teaches and partakes in STEM activities and especially supports and encourages women in STEM. To quote her, strides have been made to encourage more females to consider entering the science and engineering fields. There are special STEM programs in which girls are participating, books for girls about female role models, and hands-on competitions and other activities in which girls are being successful. I hope this video encourages you to take the information Valerie Thomas said and the work she performed to take action in getting more women involved in STEM. May she be an inspiration forever. Thank you for watching. All right, and then next up we have Kamia. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kamya Patel. I am a sophomore biomedical engineering major with a minor in business. And today my presentation is on Dr. Sally Ride, who is the first American woman in space. Today we will be talking about the adventures of Dr. Sally Ride and how she shot for the stars when it seemed impossible for women to do so. Dr. Ride was born on May 26, 1951. She grew up in California with her dad, mom, and sister. Dr. Ride's initial passion in life was for tennis, as she was one of the highest ranked tennis players in the country. However, her interest shifted after she entered university. She enrolled in Stanford University to double major in physics and English, and furthered her education by getting her master's degree and PhD in physics, conducting research in astrophysics. After her education, Dr. Ride made it into the competitive NASA astronaut program. Her journey, though, did not take her directly to space. After moving to Texas and completing an intensive training program, she worked initially as a capsule communicator for the ground control team, as well as a satellite robotic arm developer. Finally, four years later, on June 18, 1983, she qualified as an astronaut for the space shuttle program. This established Dr. Wright's milestone of becoming the first American woman in space as a mission specialist. Her flight was 147 hours long. After this revolutionary event, she took a second mission trip in 1984 that lasted 197 hours. A third trip was scheduled for Dr. Wright, but it got canceled after the tragic Space Challenger explosion. After this, she served on the Presidential Commission designated to investigate the explosion and develop the Ride Report for NASA, outlining ambitious initiatives to use space satellites to monitor climate change on Earth. She also served as an investigator for the Columbia Space Explosion post-retirement. Dr. Ride did not make it amongst the stars without challenges, though. As a woman, she was always made to feel different, whether it be being introduced as the prettiest member of the crew or being asked if she wept when she experienced problems with the shuttle. She even kept her sexuality hidden to avoid more discrimination until after she passed away on July 23, 2012, after a resilient battle against pancreatic cancer. Dr. Ride never intended on becoming the first American woman astronaut. She even made it a point to make it known that she was simply following her interests, as everyone should. She held gender equality standards highly, especially for herself. Dr. Ride never compromised in her professional life, and therefore, she achieved all of the goals she set for herself.
Dr. Wright's standing philosophy was this. She was okay with being the first, as long as she was not the only one. All right, and then next up we have Joelle. Um, I think the next one is Michael's video, but in case it is my video, I'm Joel Heredia. I am a senior at NJIT, and I study actuarial and financial mathematics. And Michael, who video is probably up, is a high school student that has worked with STEM for Success and volunteered his time with us and made videos for our, you and me. Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll take a look at the life of Emily Roblin, a historic female engineer who played a large role in the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Before detailing her engineering feats, let's take a look at Emily's early life and the era in which she lived. Emily Roebling was born on September 23, 1843 in Cold Spring, New York. Growing up in the mid-1800s, female engineers were unheard of. Instead, women were expected to remain in the home and raise children. Higher education was reserved almost exclusively for men. As we learn, Emily took huge strides forward for women in STEM, defying the restricting expectations of women during her era. Emily was the second youngest of 12 children. She had a close relationship with her brother, Governor K. Warren. An inquisitive young mind, Roebling received the equivalent of a high school education at a convent school in Washington, D.C. In 1864, Emily visited her brother, who had become a Union Army commander during the Civil War, at his headquarters. It was there that she met and fell in love with Washington Roebling, a young civil engineer on her brother's staff. The couple got married in 1865. Washington Roebling's father, John A. Roebling, was also an engineer and was actually the designer of the Brooklyn Bridge. Unfortunately, after an accident at the construction site, John Roebling got an infection and passed away. Washington Roebling was then appointed as the chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge. Unfortunately, not long after, Washington became very ill. He was so weak to the point where he was bedridden. Emily quickly stepped up. At first, she served primarily as a liaison between Washington and the engineering team. A well-read and highly intelligent woman, Emily already had a basic understanding of bridge construction and engineering principles. As she immersed herself further and further into the project in place of her husband, she soon became an expert on construction strategies, material selection, cable fabrication, and more. Over time, Emily assumed nearly all of the chief engineering responsibilities, effectively taking over for her husband as the lead on the project. For a full decade, Emily supervised the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, taking on so many responsibilities to the point where many assumed she had designed the bridge herself. Throughout the construction, she also continued to take care of her husband. At one point in 1882, Washington Roebling was in jeopardy of losing his job as chief engineer due to his illness, but Emily was able to convince politicians, who were almost entirely male at the time, to keep him in the position, effectively convincing them to continue allowing her to see the bridge to completion. The Brooklyn Bridge was finished in 1883. Sure enough, Emily Roebling was the first one to cross the bridge. Riding across the bridge in style in a horse-drawn carriage, Emily proudly carried a rooster across her lap as a symbol of victory. At the bridge's opening ceremony, fellow engineer Abram Stevens Hewitt spoke highly about Emily in his speech, saying that the opening of the bridge was, quote, an everlasting monument to the sacrificing devotion of a woman and of her capacity for that higher education from which she has been too long disbarred, end quote. Confident in her capabilities, Emily once famously said, quote, I have more brains, common sense, and know-how generally than have any two engineers, civil or uncivil. And, but for me, the Brooklyn Bridge would never have had the name Roebling in any way connected with it." End quote. A lifelong learner, Emily was able to finally pursue higher education and received a law certificate from New York University. At the time, the Brooklyn Bridge was the longest span suspension bridge in the world. The bridge, which connects Brooklyn and Manhattan, symbolized American industry and opportunity and continues to stand today. While Emily passed away in 1903, her remarkable achievement of constructing one of the architectural marvels of the 19th century as the first female field engineer in history lives on. While she never held the title of chief engineer formally, 
Her contributions were apparent and continue to be recognized today. Emily's efforts are immortalized on the plaque on the Brooklyn side of the bridge, which reads, The Builders of the Bridge, dedicated to the memory of Emily Warren Roebling, whose faith and courage helped her stricken husband, Chief Engineer Washington Roebling, complete the construction of this bridge from the plans of his father, John A. Roebling, who gave his life to the bridge. At the bottom of the plaque, there is also the following quote, Back of every great work, we can find the self-sacrificing devotion of a woman. For all of the girls watching today, remember that just as Emily Roebling was able to change the world using STEM, you can too. Thank you. Hello and... Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation called Looking Where Light Cannot Escape, where we will talk about the achievement of Katie Bowman and her development of the first black hole image. Katie Bowman is an American engineer and computer scientist that led the development of an algorithm that was essential in producing the first image of a black hole at the center of Galaxy M87. Born and raised in West Lafayette, Indiana, Katie Bowman drew inspiration from her father, Charles Bowman, who was a professor at Purdue University. There he taught electrical, computer, and biomedical engineering. Bowman began her imaging research at Purdue University while still only being a high school student. Later on, she would go on to University of Michigan where she would earn her degree in electrical engineering and later her master's and doctoral degree from MIT. In 2013, Katie Bowman became a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, where she joined the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Team, or EHD for short. EHD is a large array consisting of a global network of radio telescopes that combine data together to observe images that are supermassive, such as a black hole's event horizon. Bowman led the project of creating a Bayesian algorithm called the Continuous High Resolution Image Reconstruction using Patch Briars, or for short, JIRP, which processed data of radio signals collected by EHD's radio telescopes around the world. This algorithm played an important role by cross-validating images of objects such as stars, galaxies, and other objects in space. On April 10th, 2019, after years and 900,000 lines of code, Bowman and her team's efforts have finally paid off. And for the very first time in history, the world laid its eyes on the first image of a black hole. This milestone in science has earned Bowman and her group multiple rewards such as the Breakthrough in Physics Prize and grants for future projects. This year, the National Science Foundation rewarded Katie Bowman the career reward for her exceptional work as a scientist. Today, Bowman is a faculty member at Caltech, where she continues her imaging research with a team of scientists, looking to further advance the scientific All right, so that was the majority of the presentations we had today. We hope that you really enjoy them and that you see that women have always been involved in STEM despite the countless restrictions and difficulties they face. And we certainly come a long way in terms of women's rights, but we still have a lot more work to do to make sure it is easy and accessible for women to achieve their goals in STEM and where else, and that they feel comfortable to do so. Because women belong in STEM, because they are just as capable as men and anyone else. Um, so just uh, finish things up, unless anyone else would like to pitch in and say a few closing remarks. All right, so uh, to close the event out for today, we hope that you enjoyed it and that you see that women can do anything that they, could, they set their mind to. And that as we close out STEM month, we should also be celebrating all the women who have made historic discoveries and paved the path for us today. Thank you all so much for coming.